You're listening to the Life Purpose Advisor Podcast, Episode 43. Meditation, is this is the practice of opening your heart. And that's why I called my work the Open Heart Project, because eventually some rawness and vulnerability of your own being that is there right now, but is being denied or not seen or something, is seen. You're listening to the Life Purpose Advisor Podcast. Life Purpose. Spirituality. Higher calling. Personal growth. Meaningful life. We ask the deep questions about living a balanced life of meaning, purpose, and joy. Passion. Know thyself. Be mindful. Spiritual practice. Aha moments. Life lessons. Balance. It is time to welcome your host... Angie Swartz. Hello, this is Angie Swartz. Thanks for listening in today. I'm so glad that you've joined us. If you've been thinking about adding mindfulness and meditation to your practice, well, today is the day to listen to this podcast in its entirety because Susan Piver is joining us today. Susan is a Buddhist teacher and the New York Times bestselling author of eight books. She is the founder of the Open Heart Project, an online meditation community with nearly 15,000 members who practice together and explore ways to bring spiritual values such as kindness, genuineness, and fearlessness to everyday life. She's been featured everywhere, and we'll talk to her about those things and much, much more. Hello, Susan. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, I'm so glad that we could both make time to get together and talk a little bit about all the exciting things that you're doing. I mentioned in the intro that you've been featured everywhere. Um, I believe you heard me say that, you know, you've been featured in so many media outlets. I didn't even want to mention them, but I'm interested to ask you, what was your, what was your favorite time? Maybe that was with Oprah or with someone else that you spent time with in, in all of your appearances? Hmm. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to say about a favorite because they're always so nerve wracking and, and you don't really spend time with Oprah or Katie Couric or anything like that. There's, you just sort of show up and they ask you questions and you don't really meet them beforehand or anything like that. But, um, yeah, the Oprah show, you know, was back in the day was, uh, it was a great experience. It was, uh, terrifying experience but it was they they did a lot to make it easy for their guests to relax so they were a great team Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. several of my guests have been on the oprah show and and say several similar things to what you're saying and and i believe another person even said that um when they were on the oprah show earlier on prior to so much fame that it was a a a more rich experience that it had become towards the end Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. Um, but tell us some about what you're working on these days. Sure. Well, I am always working on the Open Heart Project, which is my online meditation community, and uh, trying to create more programming and bring in guest teachers and uh, develop curricula to teach things that people uh, request to learn about. And it's it's really been quite an amazing experience to create this project. It's called the Open Heart Project, and it's there are now nearly fifteen thousand people all over the world who are, get meditation instruction from me. I guess I guess it's me. And then after a period of time, quite naturally, when people meditate, they would like more. They would like to learn about the principles behind the practice or meet the other people who are meditating together with them. And so I'm trying to provide as many opportunities as I can for people to experience the um, delights and difficulties of spiritual practice who would otherwise not be able to experience them necessarily because they live in Alaska or Venezuela or places where there aren't a lot of options. So that's a continuing uh, project. And I have a new book coming out in September called Start Here Now, An Open-Hearted Guide to the Path and Practice of medita- Meditation. And so I'm gearing up to support that and trying to figure out the best ways to share that book with others. Mm, mm-hmm. And folks that are listening can find that book in September on Amazon. Is that the best 
place to look for it? Yeah, you know, Amazon or Barnes & Noble or uh, BookSense, which is the independent booksellers online entity. Perfect. Perfect. I I love what you're what you're doing with mindfulness and meditation. I watched some of your YouTube videos again this morning, and um, interesting to note for any of you listening that Susan's uh, and I believe this is true. Please correct me if this isn't right. But the your most popular uh, video on YouTube is a five minute intro to meditation, and most of it is silent. Most of it is you introducing uh, a sitting practice. Um, and for five minutes, nothing's, I mean, nothing's, I shouldn't say nothing's happening. Very much is happening. But from a YouTube perspective, it's a very silent <laughs> sitting practice. <laughs> yeah, meditation, you know, one would think doesn't make good television, you know, doesn't make good uh, YouTube videos. But if people are looking for um, an introduction to the practice and are scared, as you know, most of us are, or worried that they can't sit for an hour or a half hour, well, we could try five minutes. And some context setting, some basic introduction for how to practice is all you really need. And people must ask you that all the time. Like, if I just want to start with one or two minutes, what do I do? And what do you say to that? Yeah, I I, I say get instruction from an actual teacher. Uh, whether it's in person or online or through their book, don't make anything up because it's a very um, ancient practice. It's been honed and tested by countless people, and it's very important to have a teacher. I don't mean like a guru teacher. I just mean someone who can introduce you to the practice. Otherwise, it can easily become very confusing. So that's the first thing, and... You know, then I just try to say there are three things to be mindful of. Your body, and the posture is fairly specific, and the breath, placement of attention on breath, and the mind. And there's no effort made to stop thinking. That's the biggest misconception about meditation, is that in order to, order to do it, you have to stop thinking, which is crazy. Um, you can think all you want. You just take a different relationship to your thoughts. Um, but it's hard to sort of say... Oh, here's the concise instruction. Now go do it. It's it's too important for that, I think. So something a little more considered would be useful. And your group in the Open Heart Project does just that together? Yeah, I send out, it's free, and I send out an instructional video every Monday. When I first started the Open Heart Project, I was sending out three videos a week. But that was too much. That was overwhelming, understandably. So it's one 10-minute meditation sit that is guided in the sense that if I came to your house and said, okay, we're going to meditate, now please take your seat, and I would just, it's as if I could come to your house. That was my idea for it. I wanted it to be like I could come to your house and we could practice together. So I guide the practice, and over, you know, time people have questions understandably like what do I do if my foot falls asleep or you know am I allowed to scratch my head (laughs) or you know why do I cry this all the time when I sit down to meditate so I started prefacing each sit with a short answer to a question a little talk like sometimes as short as two minutes sometimes as long as maybe 10 minutes but it's addressing some principle of the practice. So then we practice together. And so I wanted it to be, in addition to I can just come to your house, just something that all you have to do is press play. And then the, everything else will take care of itself. So all you have to do is get to your computer, sit down, and press play, and then we'll practice together. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And and how lucky are we to be listening to you and and getting to know that juicy knowledge that it's free. It's free, everyone listening, free. Once a week, Susan will come into your home and to help you learn how to meditate. Mm -hmm. I noticed when we were talking, you said uh, you seemed a little reluctant to to be the person that's featured. You said, I guess it's me. (laughs) and and are you not are you not quite there on saying that you are a mindfulness teacher? Oh no, I yeah, I know I appreciate you saying that, but I'm there saying I'm a meditation teacher. But it's just it's a funny it 
it's a funny relationship when I make a recording on a certain day and time, and then I don't really know when someone's watching it. I don't know what they think. I don't know, you know, if it's useful or I don't know anything. So when I say I guess it's me, it's it's a it's a video of me. So uh, is that the same thing as me? I you know. I, I, I don't know, but that's what prompted me to say, I guess it's me. Right, right. You and your digital form. Right, exactly. Versus someone else's digital form, <laughs> right. for sure. Right. So, so since I have you here, maybe I can, maybe I can try to get you to give some of those answers. So what, what are we, can we scratch our head? And what do we do if our foot falls asleep? And what, what about when we're crying in meditation? <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. So yes, you know, different traditions have different, um, modifications to the basic instruction. So if I was a Zen teacher, I would say, no, you can't scratch your head. Just sit with it, be with it. And that's, you know, totally reasonable. But in the lineage I practice in, Shambhala Buddhism, <clears throat> a Tibetan tradition, it's it's more relaxed in that particular way. Although, you know, I can't say that it's any less stringent. But the instruction instead is... Yeah, when you have an itch and you want to scratch your head, just don't scratch reflexively. Like, pause, feel what it feels like to have an itchy head, or whatever it is, and then notice the movement of your hand up to your head and really what it feels like to scratch that itch. And then notice what it feels like to have that itch gone. And replace your hand um, on your legs and resume the breath awareness practice. And similar, same thing if your foot's asleep, just first feel what it's like to have a foot that's asleep and what it's like to stretch it out and wiggle your toes and feel the sleepiness dissipate and then replace it. So it becomes a part of the practice. Um, And But in the Zen tradition, again, it's like just sit with that. Watch it. And that's also, you know, a very valuable approach. Both approaches make sense. And then for if you sit down and cry all the time, that is actually really understandable, too. Often when we sit down to practice, there's a kind of relaxation takes place that's different than spacing out or, you know, taking a nap. It's a kind of inner relaxation. And often what we are most holding at bay then we're not holding it at bay because we've relaxed and it arises. So for some people that's sadness, many people that's sadness. For many people that is fatigue. So a lot of people sit down to practice and fall asleep, which, you know, makes sense. And the reason for this is because everybody's extremely tired. So maybe take a nap instead. But for the crying, it's... Meditation, is this is the practice of opening your heart. And that's why I called my work the Open Heart Project, because eventually it doesn't make some, some rawness and vulnerability of your own being that is there right now, but is being, I don't know, denied or not seen or something, is seen and felt. And that's the opening for everything we desire compassion and creativity and love all ride on that capacity to open. So it's important, even though it can be disorienting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's my, my same belief around finding your, one's life purpose. Um, in fact, in my program, practices and rituals are one of the four modules. Um, and I believe that we always know our purpose. We just can't feel it we can't hear it because we're so covered up with the busyness of life and emotional wounds other things Mm -hmm. um um, so i appreciate what you're saying about opening our hearts so that we can hear ourselves speak what is your what is your life purpose my life purpose is to help others find their purpose Mm -hmm. and to open communication that's awesome cool so i don't you're the first person that's ever asked me that on this show (laughs) So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that. You're so welcome. Um, so I'd love to talk to you about your purpose. And uh, your work is so interesting. We could spend our whole time talking about that. Um, but are you okay with going in a little more personal direction? Sure. So my first question is, do you know your life purpose? 
I am always a little uncertain. Um, but my purpose, I think, has something to do with communication. But the form it takes is always shifting and is not necessarily known to me beyond that. So something with communication, something with uh, explaining the Dharma in ordinary words so that anyone can understand, something like that. But I don't really know beyond that. So that's what I would say. And how long have you know, have you known that, or have you discovered different pieces of it along your life? Were there aha moments along the way, things that pointed you in directions? It, it was more in retrospect. I see that that's what hap- what's happening, and and I've learned in my life whenever I try to direct the future. For me, the kind of person I am, or my karma, or I don't know what, it never works. It it always backfires. It just ends up being very confusing to me. So for lack of other options, I have given up (laughs) too much trying to direct the future. And, you know, of course, I, I and everyone has to be very pragmatic and intelligent about financial things and, you know, just health things and so on. I'm not saying I've abandoned taking care of myself or taking care of business, so to speak, on the multiple levels that one has to attend to. But if I try to direct where I want everything to go, it just has never worked for me. So I've just figured that I have to just go along with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have an example of when things haven't worked, when you've tried to force it with masculine energy? Oh, um, I never thought of it as a masculine energy, but um, I guess I, some years ago, started a book packaging business. And I could see it. I knew it was a good idea. Book packaging, meaning combining a book with some other media. And I had done it when I worked for someone else. And I knew that there was value in this idea. And I just thought, well, someone should do this. And and I did it. And it wasn't a bust, but it was not. did not make me happy. And it was exhausting, and it was not rewarding on any level. Well, creatively, it was somewhat rewarding, but I just, it was very conceptual. I had an idea, and I I, I still think it was a good idea, but, but a good idea is almost worthless in terms of making life decisions. <laughs> so I guess that's an example. Okay. Uh, and... <clears throat> Excuse me, but you you do make some plans about if we look at your website, you have some future events coming up. You have some structure around what's going on with your with your teachings and your business and you do a call every week. And um, I'm interested to know what what the inspiration is for you that flows through your life influencing when you do make a plan. Well, the Dharma is is very inspiring to me. And also the people that are part of the Open Heart Project are very inspiring to me. So they, I get a sense of something that I think might be useful to them, either because someone says this would be useful to me or my intuition just tells me this would be a good thing. So I, I try to riff and vibe off of what I actually am encountering and then say, oh, okay, I see if something's happening. Let me make a plan to do that. But if it's just conceptual, meaning I just made it up in my head, absent any communication with the outside world, then it doesn't. I wait to find that communication at this point in my life. I I just wait. And if that communication arises either between me and my community or me and the Dharma, then I'll do it. But absent that, I just keep it, you know, on a list of someday things. 
Mm-hmm. And ha- how do you know the difference between just a conversation that you're having in your head and a conversation between you and the Dharma? I just do. I just do. How, w- how would someone that's listening know that, learn from that and know the difference for themselves? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know how I, it, it works for me. So I don't know how someone else could learn. But I believe that it's predicated on continual expansion of self-knowledge and relaxing with yourself you know i'm not i've never had like an experience of some you know hearing a voice or well maybe once i did but otherwise i i don't really <laughs> it's not clear it's not obvious but it's when as you you know get older and learn yourself learn who you are and see when you didn't honor your intuition and what happened and then just start to develop some faith in your own intuition then you know but not everybody's built like that i'm not saying that this is the best way to do things it's the best way for me to do things but some people are really good at making plans and then executing those plans and i really respect that and admire that and sometimes i wish i could do that but i've just learned that that's not for me so but i'm not saying that my way is the way it is the ideal way it's very personal Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure there's lots of folks that are listening that can relate to what you're saying. And that's why we talk about these Mm -hmm. things for sure. Um, We are all different for sure. Um, But let's let's talk about your France trip. So you just got got back not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And in this in the terms of this discussion, let's talk about how that came about, because there had to be some planning around that. Yeah, um, and maybe we can I, use that as an example. Uh, sure. I, I'm not trying to say I don't plan things. I just show up and, you know, I, I, have, I have a business to run and I have a, 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 a partner and a household and family and there's a lot of plans. My schedule is full of things that I'm doing. So I'm not trying to give the impression that I don't plan things, but I don't plan too far out. Or if, if someone said, what do you want the Open Heart Project to become? You know, I have some ideas about that. But I don't have like a five-year plan or this is where we're going. It's happening more organically, which again for me is the only way it seems to work. But so I did, I did teach in France for two weeks. It was really, really fun. I loved it. And it came about because I got invited to do it and it sounded like fun. So I said yes. And it's, uh, I taught it. Let me see. Do I want to teach mindfulness in France yeah. for a couple of weeks? Hmm. Yeah. I think that would be a good thing. Yeah, exactly. In June, <laughs> you know, in, in, in rural France where it's just like so beautiful. Let me see. Yes, I do. Were you at a retreat center or what kind of place, location were you in? Yeah, I was at a retreat center called Dechen Choling which is in near Limoges and I've taught I, now this is the third time I've taught there and it's uh, a retreat center in my lineage Shambhala lineage so I felt like even the first time even though I'd never been there I felt like I get it I know what I I, I will feel at home there and then we talked about what I would teach I taught two programs and I suggested teaching the op- a program called the open heart retreat because I know there are a lot of members of the Open Heart Project in Europe, and just everyone wants to open their heart or wants to, you know, figure out what that means. And I wanted a chance to do something in Europe that maybe I could actually meet people in the Open Heart Project in Europe. So I taught that. That was for a week. And then I taught a meditation and writing retreat also for a week. And that I've taught many times in various places. And I love teaching that, so it was great. I was I, I get to be on retreat too, so I, there's nothing I love more than being on retreat. So it was awesome. Mm-hmm. Were you speaking French or English? No, oh, mais non, je ne parle pas français. <laughs> ah, just un, un petit peu. No, that's actually the extent of everything I can say in French right now. <laughs> <laughs> Except food, I can speak food, but um, no, I taught in English, and there was a, fr- uh, a translator uh, for French students. So there are people from the UK, people from the Netherlands, people from the United States who speak English, and then for French speakers, there was a translator, a simultaneous translator. So it wasn't like I said something and then waited and they said it. They had headphones, and 
and, it, and it's great to be translated in, in the sense that as a teacher, it really it slows you down. It it compels you to be very concise and clear, and to make full thoughts. So to express full thoughts. So it's it's very valuable just for the teacher to be translated. I believe. Do you have a favorite experience from this trip to France? Hmm. There are so many good experiences. Yeah, actually, I think one of my favorite parts was in the mornings, because, you know, you're sitting all day in either retreat. There's a lot of sitting. And I decided to start, and it was, you're in France, and it's June, and the birds are singing, and it's so beautiful. It's like lush and farmlands and rolling hills and the whole nine yards. So I decided to, we would start each day with a silent walk and just in line, what, no talking. And it was so wonderful to be together and to walk out into the French countryside together, but also in silence so that everyone could have their own experience. And, you know, we didn't walk forever, but we took about a 40-minute walk up and down through various lanes and up and down hills. And it was a great way to start the day. That was really fun. Mm. And are you doing this again anytime soon for those of us who are salivating as you speak? Uh, Yes, I'm doing it exactly the same thing on exactly the same dates in 2016. I'll be June 1st to the 14th at Dechen Scholing teaching these two programs. So I'm really happy I'm going back. And I'm teaching also the meditation and writing retreat in Colorado in December, which is obviously very different. Colorado is different from France. December is different from June. But it's just as potent an environment and in some ways more potent because December in the Rockies, it's like it's a very internal experience. You, you, You want to turn within. And at the same time, you're supported by this extraordinary drama of the mountains and and the snow. And I love teaching at Shambhala. It's at Shambhala Mountain Center in Colorado. I love teaching there. Mm-hmm. I, <clears throat> several years ago, I attended the Alia Summer Institute um, and met some folks that do work in that center. And it's highly on my list to get out there and visit it. That's awesome. Um, um, that have you been to that conference as well and spoken there? No, I don't think I've ever heard of that one. What is it called? Alia? It's Alia. It stands for Authentic Leadership in Action, mm-hmm. and it's it's in conjunction with the Shambhala Sun folks. Um, so right in your family neighborhood of people. Oh, cool. Um, but it's a Buddhist based conference, although they don't advertise it as that. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm sure they would love 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 to have you. <laughs> Um, so, so going back to what we were talking about before, about your purpose and saying, you were saying that you would it just come to the realization. Um, and, but if you're looking back at your life, would you say that there are any monumental times that were pointing you to where you are today? Hmm. Well, there've been a lot of, uh, I don't know what to call them, just, uh, coincidences or, uh, just serendipitous yeah, events. Exactly. Serendipitous events that seem to lead the way. And then, you know, we see what happens. But yeah, there definitely have been serendipitous events that I don't understand. <laughs> but in some ways, you know, for all of us, everything is pointing you to exactly where you are right now. There's. Right. No way that it didn't. So everything. And when you say when you say you don't understand, you mean even still or at the time? Both. I mean, I understand what was happening. I don't get why it happened, or you know right. why it happened to me. Or some things were very good, some things not so good. Yeah. Can you tell us a little of the not so good ones? Because I think people that are out there listening, um, that are. Ex- Experiencing some of those not so good times have a hard time knowing that they are part of the path that's getting us where we're going. Yeah, they are part of the path. It doesn't, which knowing that does not make them any less painful. It just maybe can offer some sense that yeah, it's all going somewhere. 
And I think it is. I mean, I don't know. I'm not at the end of my life, and I'm not dead, so I can't tell you what happens after you're dead. But I think it's all going somewhere. But you know what? You just don't know until it's over. So, And then who knows what you know at that point. But anyway, I don't want to get too cosmic. But, well, I guess the, the main difficult thing, bad thing, was I was in a really bad accident a long time ago that just really changed the course of my life, I guess you would say, in the sense that it made certain injuries and chronic health things that are, you know, I would be a different person without them. And and I was hit by a drunk driver. I was just sitting there. And so it was a very serendipitous it was very like what you know I just totally nothing prepares you for something like that so you know that was not such a good thing but it happened and it did change me it changed me a lot because it was very deep injuries very significant injuries and I have a picture on my desk of the car that I was in, which was a 67 Beetle, <laughs> which is basically like a tin can. And it was, uh, the side of it is just completely crushed. I was driving and I was thrown out the passenger door somehow. I don't know. I have no memory of the, of the whole thing, but I have a picture of the car, the crumpled car on my desk. And it, you know, if I ever think, oh, you know, I'm having a really cruddy day or whatever, I just look at that picture and I go, actually, no, you're not. You're not having a bad day. <laughs> Pretty good day. <laughs> not so bad. Not so bad after all. And also, it just, I don't know, it, it brings me back to a moment, I'm looking at it right now, when life and death were very close to each other. And as a practitioner, it's very valuable to remember that such mo- such moments are always at hand and you just don't know when they're going to come. So it is very good to remember the preciousness of your own life. So those things that drive us crazy, like our microphones not working or our yeah. phone having a hiccup or the wrong contact in the wrong place or someone being late, it helps us remember that those are just little tiny things, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't. I get irritated all the time, but I don't tend to get irritated by things like that at all. I don't know if it's because I had a car accident or not. I just, like, uh, life's too short to get upset about things like that. It could be something like that little meditation practice that you're leading 15,000 people in that <laughs> contribute to that, do you think? Maybe. <laughs> like, I forget. But, I've been practicing for 20 years, so that's got to have something to do with it. What, what is your own sitting practice like? My own sitting practice is just like everyone's sitting practice. It's... I, I push my way to it. You know, it's I, I just like everyone is like, I don't, I don't want to do it. Okay, well, just do it anyway. And I try to rest with my own mind and um, make space for who I am and not have an agenda for my practice. Instead, just to do it because having an agenda, even if it's a great agenda, like I want to become more patient or I... I want to feel less pain, really important things. But somehow applying the agenda while you're sitting or checking is the agenda being met. It it makes the practice devoid of magic. So I try to let go of all agendas. And, you know, then I also do some practices that are meant to increase my own connection to wisdom and compassion. So I try to do those too. And some days I don't, and some days it's like, wow, that was so deep and so wonderful, and some days I'm just, like, phoning it in, like, is this over yet? So, you know, it's just like everyone. It's just like everyone else's practice. However, it does deepen over time, and the deepening, I've become convinced, does not become obvious in the practice itself, but in the way you live your life. So as long as that is continuing to deepen, I am assuming that my practice is working, even though I'm not good at practice. I'm not any better at doing it than anybody else. 
Do you have a sacred space and a time commitment every day, certain time of the day, or is it all over the place? I have a I have a shrine and a meditation cushion, and you know, so that I practice try to practice there, and I try to practice in the morning because otherwise the day gets too absorbing, it gets away from me, and then I'm tired, and so I don't do it. So I, I just I try to sit in the morning. And how about a time commitment? No, I, I sort of choose on the spot. Today I feel that this, I and mean, I try not to let myself slide too much, but I, I don't say to, every day must be 45 minutes or something like that. I sort of decide on the spot, which I, so, I would not suggest to beginning practitioners. It's, right. it's very important to have a time commitment. But it's very important that 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 commitment be doable, like 10 minutes. But not, if you say to yourself, I'm going to meditate for a half hour every day for the rest of my life, very soon your meditation practice will disappear from your life because you won't do it. And then you'll feel bad. And then meditation will be associated with some kind of bad feeling. And, you know, then, no, that's not a good idea. But if you say to yourself, I'm going to practice for 10 minutes Monday through Friday for two weeks, that's doable. And then after two weeks, then you reassess. Well, oh, it's too much. I'm going to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Or no, it's too little. I'm going to do 20 minutes for two weeks. So just step by step. But it, the commitment, I'm going to do this every day for, from now on, is a bad thing to do. Don't do it. Do you ever ever have those days where you've got to be at the airport, you've got to get up at four, and you say, okay, I'm just going to get to my cushion for two minutes today because that's what I've got? Yeah, sure. And I have days when I yeah. don't get to it. I get to it for zero minutes. But I. But the, pra- the practice, I think this is an important point. The practice is that you have a practice, right, that, that it's you always go back to it. Yeah, I guess so. I do have a practice. And it has been a part of my life for 20 years, so it is consistent. But from day to day, the consistency, it doesn't always feel consistent. But over months and years, it is. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think it's a very, very important point for for people that feel intimidated by the routine of, as you said, 10 minutes or 30 minutes every day or um, because to me, the practice is the commitment to the practice over time, Mm -hmm. um, which can can be very rewarding. Absolutely. And I want to share with you the instruction for when you make a commitment to practice and then you fail to honor it and then you feel bad. And this instruction was given by the Tibetan meditation master Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who brought the Shambhala teachings to the West, the lineage I practice in. He was born in Tibet, a classically trained monk who shed his monk's robes and dressed as a Westerner and taught many students, not including myself, because he died before I became a practitioner. But this is what he told his students about those days when you feel bad for not practicing. And I'm kind of paraphrasing. He said, you should feel really bad, like terrible, for like 12 seconds. And then you have got to cut that BS out because (laughs) it is not helpful. So feeling bad, optional. But if you feel like you must beat yourself up, literally look at a timer and beat the crap out of yourself for 12 seconds. And then you got to cut. Stop because it is very destructive. So just don't do it. Love that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing that. And and since we're talking about about him and, and that faith, if we'll call it, I know that um, from listening to other interviews that you've done, some really wonderful ones that I'll point out for those of you listening, really wonderful interview with The Good Life Project and Jonathan Fields and with Gregory Berg, um, on his work on Enzo Radio, some some good other places that you can listen to Susan out there. Um, but I know that you're Jewish or that you were raised Jewish mm-hmm. and and that you're now a Buddhist. Mm-hmm. Um, 
what would you say about your own spirituality? And do, do you believe in something bigger than you? Where Where are you on all of that today? Hmm. I, about my own spirituality, I am a Buddhist practitioner. I am a student of Buddhism and, as it happens, also a teacher. But that is my practice and that is my path. And in terms of believing in something bigger than me, what do you mean? Do you believe in a God? Do you believe in the universe? What do you think? I know you said you don't know what happens to us when we die and you didn't want to get too cosmic, but let's just go there for a little bit. Okay. Uh, I don't... I try to stay away from beliefs in general because they don't seem very useful. And in some way, strong beliefs are an obstacle and a sign of an absence of faith. Although other people would tell you that beliefs are a sign of faith, I would say they are a sign of absence of faith because the, they are obstacles to seeing what is actually happening right in front of you. And I believe that, even though we're talking about beliefs, nonetheless, this is my point of view, that to walk in the world without the shield of beliefs, this is where we go after we die, or I believe the universe is good, or anything like that, is usually meant as a shield. But to walk into the world without a shield is the act of warriorship and it is a state of being raw and open and that seems to be the same state as being compassionate and able to connect with others so in when it comes to God I'll go with what Sogyal Rinpoche said I heard him recently in a video on YouTube say this and it just really stopped my mind it was so great he said Buddhists deny the existence of God but not the nature of God and that really sounded very right to me very right so that is I guess the best uh, explanation that for me of what I think about that but do I believe there are Wisdoms greater than my own, 100%. Do I think that there are forces in our world that can support us and guide us or hurt us and mislead us? I do. Do I know what they are or how to access them? No, I don't. Um, so it's a big exploration, I would say. I don't know, what would you say? Mm, mm. Let's stick with you. Okay. We're here to talk about you okay. today. Okay. I, I, I'm, my beliefs are not that far off from yours. As I continue to study, there's so many similarities to, to so many different belief systems out there that um, my practice is, is in unity. And I love getting to learn something new that I haven't been exposed to when it comes along or when I reach out to, to see it. Mm. So... Maybe not said as eloquently as you, but that's that's where I am with it all. Cool. And I enjoy asking this question to everyone that I speak to for the purposes of uh, broadening the minds of anyone that is stuck in a belief system that might not fit them or that they might be growing bigger than, or maybe that's not the right set of words, but might be um, feeling constrained by, I guess. Yeah, there, there's, there are many belief systems that can deepen your connection to reality. It, it's very personal. It's very personal. It, it is very personal. Very personal. The, the, I think my goal with my own practice is to show up with a big light mm -hmm. to influence someone that has no belief or, or isn't, uh, isn't curious of that nature to, to have a second thought about that. Mm. Cool. So, so there's that. There's that. Um, going back to some, some additional, thank you for going there. Um, some additional questions. Have there, are there any tools that you would recommend, tools that you've used over the years to get to know yourself better that you'd recommend someone else look into? Hmm. For me, meditation is the best tool. And writing 
is very helpful for me, but I know it's not helpful for everyone. And having a teacher is the best tool and not easy to find, but there is no better tool than that. Do you, do you believe the saying, when the student is ready, the teacher appears? I don't think anything is ever that simple. So sometimes that seems true, but there's no aphorism that can capture the truth of this teacher-student relationship or other great truths, I don't think. So for someone that's listening, that's look, that's listening to what you said, that says, I don't have a teacher and I don't know where to find one, what, what should we tell them? <laughs> well, if you read something or listen to a podcast or you hear, you know, let's just say, for example, you listen to this podcast and you think, oh, Susan, that's interesting. I like her. What's up with her? Then and I'm looking for a teacher, well, look at my teacher and look at his or her teacher and start to take an interest in the teachers of those who say things that cause you to think or feel. And then just start reading those people or listening to their talks online. Or if if you can go to hear them, go hear them. If they're alive, if they're dead, then just read more or or find more of their students who can elucidate what you resonate with for you. So just start tracing breadcrumbs and just start tracing it back until the real, you know, until the actual lineage holder, the real teacher, you know who that person is. And then uh, try to connect with them either through in-person study or listening to their talks online or reading their books. That's the best suggestion I can give, but it's not easy. And and no, 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 Teacher's just going to knock on your door when you say, hey, I'm your teacher, I'm here. It's, you know, not going to happen for 9.9 out of 10 of us, let's say, because who knows, maybe it'll happen for someone. <laughs> right. Great, great advice. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that you were in a, a very serious car accident and that you've, it sounds like it gave you an opportunity to, to really get closer with your physical body. Um, whether you were ready for that or not. Do you think that that the physical body plays a role in staying in line with our purpose? Um, yeah, there's no doing anything without it. So, you know, it's the source of information and it's the place where emotion lives. Emotion doesn't live in your head. It lives in your body somewhere, it seems. And so helping you identify what's going on within yourself you know you could feel more at home in your own body that's that's very helpful but there's no separation of well my body and my mind or you know I'll try to pay more attention to my body because you just said that while you were in your body <laughs> mm-hmm. so it, mm-hmm. it's but yeah to, to developing a greater sense of home in your body I would think would be really, really useful. Mm -hmm. How about nutrition and exercise and and all of the things, the things that go with taking care of our bodies? Yeah, they're very, those are good things. No one could say those are bad things. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. Any, any, do you have any sacred practices around what you eat or uh, any of those things that you want to share with us? I don't really have a, you know, I just try to eat what I think is good for me and watch things that are bad for me and not partake of them and especially since I was so injured at one point I just naturally fell into this well I can't tolerate certain things so I'll just be careful with my body and yeah I try to exercise like everybody else I I, but it's I can't it's too much to I try not to have be too ambitious with anything because then I just beca- get in this cycle of ambition and disappointment. And I, you know, I try to do something every day that's... But I used to be very, very athletic. Even after my car accident, I still recovered some kind of athleticism. And I have been an athletic... I have an athletic constitution. So... But I've sort of given up 
thinking, well, I'll become a marathon runner, although maybe I will. Let me just take a walk every day. And, or let me, you know, do a half hour of yoga. I, so I try to do something like that every day. Mm, very nice. Me too. Me too. That's good. Uh, it's just, just like our, what we were talking about with our practice of, of sitting practice, I believe the same thing around my physical practice. Just because I might miss a day does not mean I don't have a physical exercise practice. Right. So, right. Um, but I'm right there with you on that. Um, since we're talking about the physical body, I mentioned to you earlier when we were talking that we have a question that came from Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, consi- and, and I'll just read it to you if that's okay. Sure. <clears throat> Consider that the many physio- physiological heart conditions may be founded in a spiritual context, like an empty heart syndrome. And if so, how does one honor the heart and fill it with love? So I'm not sure I understand that question. I think it's starting out saying there are health conditions that can be connected to having an empty heart and that can make you unhealthy somehow. That's the physiological piece, I think, that's part of the question. And so how can you balance that by filling your heart with love so you don't have to have the health problems or so that you can just feel happier, I suppose? I may not understand the question, but that well, let's yes. let's start with the first part. Do you believe that someone that's um, has a very closed heart, since we're since your business is about opening the heart, that do you believe that that manifests in physical symptoms? I have no idea. I, I have okay. no idea. Fair enough. So, so the second part. And so going going back to what you were saying about the filling the empty heart? Yeah, well, I think that question is presumes that there is a vessel that can be that can be measured for fullness or emptiness. And I just don't think there is. So I couldn't say this is how you fill your heart because if you just go about your day and observe the feelings you have in your heart from moment to moment is changing. You see something on the street that touches you and your heart is full. You, someone, you encounter a problem at work that you've encountered a million times and you can't find anything in your heart to address it. Your heart is empty. So it's not like there's someone who can fill your heart, even yourself, like as if there was a separation, like let me do these things for my heart. It's just, I don't think it works that way. It's more a sense of observing the natural pulsation of your heart without trying to fill it or begrudge its empty moments. And instead to just make friends with it. Oh, now it feels full. Now it feels empty. Oh, okay, what's going to happen next? Whatever it is, I will be with you. I will be there. I think is more fruitful way of looking at it than how do I fill something that's empty because who knows what's going on in there and some moments it feels full and some moments it doesn't so again just navigating with it as a friend rather than a um, instructor I think is a kind more kind to yourself does that make sense so be the observer. Always be the friend and the observer. Not, not the observer. The friend. The obser- observation I means step, has stepped outside and is looking at. And that's not, I don't mean anything that clinical. I mean being with, feeling, 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 feeling the full moments completely and feeling the empty moments completely. And when you judge the full moments as better, also feeling that, and when you judge the empty moments as inadequate, feeling that, and feeling, feeling, feeling is what I mean, which is really different than observing. Mm, I'm enjoying that term of, of thinking about a parts of us as our friend because it, it allows me to think about, well, if it was my friend that I would perceive that's feeling the way I feel like this question is asking about, what would I do? What would I do for that external friend you would be with them you would be let me let me listen to you let me 
I'll just come and sit with you. I'll just hang out. I'm here for you. That we we tend to take a very mechanistic approach to ourselves. I'm not saying that the questioner is, but a mechanistic approach, and that let me fiddle with this part, and then okay, let me fiddle with that part, and someday I'm going to get it right. And you're not. It's not ever going to be right. And the fiddling is often masked self-aggression. That separates you from yourself so I've had to learn this lesson too because I'm constantly striving and I'm a very ambitious person and I I want to do a lot of things with my life and it takes work to find a balance between this striving and self-aggression and it, it's not easy to, to do does that make sense? Absolutely. Cool. I was just letting that be, just just being with that statement for a moment. Mm-hmm. It's a big one. It is. It is. If we all have so much doubt in our own basic goodness and so much uncertainty about our own worthiness, and when we feel that we don't want that uncertainty, then we can bounce to the other extreme of pretending that we think we're worthy. <laughs> Um, we're getting mad at people who make us feel unworthy, like it's your fault that I feel unworthy. But it, the problem of unworthiness is a very profound and far-reaching one. If someone is with you and they start talking to you about feeling unworthy, what what's what what's your go-to? Uh, and maybe you don't. Maybe it's it's subjective for every time. But what would you say? It is subjective for every time because. Depending on how the person is, I feel, I, and as a teacher, I try to do this too. I try to feel, is this person being too hard on themselves, which is often the case. And then I try to soften my own heart. Instead of trying to tell them anything, this is what you should do, or this is my reaction to that, I just try to soften my own presence and just be gentle in my own heart and listen more. And if I feel they're being too... Um, let's see, what's a good word? Uh, whiny? <laughs> or, you know, not uh, are giving in to something that they are actually stronger and have more capacity to deal with than what they're exhibiting right now, then I feel I try to toughen my own heart. Not, not against them or not to become cold, but I try to sharpen my own presence and feel more clear about what about their worthiness but it's n- almost never in what i say and as a teacher i find this too that what you say is really secondary but how you feel in your own heart relative to that person is the teaching for both of you Hmm. Isn't that true? Let's just can you just say that again? <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, the words that you use as a teacher are always secondary, but how you feel in your heart toward that person and how you modulate your own inner environment in reaction to that person, that is the teaching for both of you. Amazing. Maybe we'll just cut out the whole rest of the interview and just put that out just by itself <laughs> because that's the richness. Very, very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so teaching is a very vulnerable thing. Yes, we have to learn all those lessons to be able to teach them, right? Well, you have to let yourself be touched by everyone, and that's the only way you'll know what to do or say. So the vulnerable part is allowing yourself to be touched. When did you know that you were going to be a teacher? That is something I feel is in my DNA, so to speak. I have all, Whatever I've done in my life, I've always sort of started talking about it to others. It's been, I get it, someone says, why don't you run this meeting or why don't you do this training for us or why don't you, you know, do, someone wants to interview us about something, you, you let them interview you. So I've always found myself in that role. And I like teaching, but I think really my best skill, if I may say, is writing 
and I'm always trying to find more time for that and having less and less time as life proceeds these days. But that's, I think, the core of my purpose somehow is involved in writing. But teaching is also obviously a great form of communication. And, in, well, and your writing is teaching us as we read it, I'm sure. That's my hope, certainly. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. And, and just we shouldn't, we've talked about a lot of many serious things, but you're a great lover of music. Okay, I am. I love music. <laughs> I really do. Let's just talk about music. Let's tell us some of your favorites. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that's impossible. Um, or maybe who you were listening to this morning or the, more, the most recent. Hmm. Who have I been listening to recently? Oh, I have a great mix. I know everybody says, I like all kinds of music. but And I do. I do like all kinds of music. I don't know very much about opera and many forms of classical music, but popular music I do I do know a lot about and listen to a lot. So I think, I think yesterday I was listening to Bobby Blue Bland. I, you know, Bobby Bland, the great... Great, great vocalist who put out the, I think it was, I don't remember what year it was, 1967 or something, Two Steps from the Blues, which was a seminal record in the blues world. So I was listening to Bobby Blue Bland, and I love blues. When B.B. King died, I listened to a lot of B.B. King, and I just read that Willie Nelson is getting some Library of Congress award or something like that, and I idolize Willie Nelson. So... um I love him. Very happy he's getting any, re- you know, all recognition, which he's gotten a lot of. But the more, the better, because he deserves it. And you love his music, or you love him as a person, or both? I love. I don't know him as a person. I mean, I've met him, but I don't really know him. But I love his. I love him as an artist. He's a fantastic artist. So, so rich and real and natural and cool. I mean, if cool is the definition of. Uh, the definition of cool is not going too fast. That's my definition. Anyone who's cool does never see never seems to be in a hurry. And did you is that was that your belief when you were a teenager no, and I, in your early twenties? No, I just observed it. I don't think I actually could give words to it. I worked in the music business for some time in like the nineties, late eighties into the mid nineties and I guess I observed it then and in, by that definition, Willie Nelson is the coolest guy ever because if you listen to him, you're like, the beat just happened. Is he going to come in? And then, boom, just before the beat disappears, there he is. He's, <laughs> he's, he's great that way. I love him. I think the first time I ever, and, and I'll use this term lightly, remembering who I'm speaking to, but <clears throat> the first time I ever experienced heartbreak, I was in a, a freshman in high school and and Willie Willie Nelson's song, Maybe I Didn't Love You, whatever that, uh, yeah, that was the song. And I remember crying to that song and my mother just saying, oh, would you toughen up? Like, you're you're in ninth grade. Oh, no. Oh, deal? heart is a heart. And it break, when it breaks, so, it breaks. And that's a great heartbreak song. That, yeah. That'll make you cry, absolutely. And those tears are it's, good. Certainly did. Yeah. Certainly did. Yeah. So, and I still can go back there if I allow myself. Sure. But, so it's I could talk to you for hours and hours. May I ask you a short lightning round of yes or no short answer questions? Yes. Here we Was go. That the first one. Uh, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> um, do you think passion and purpose are the same things? No. Do you think everybody has a life purpose? Yes. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being high, how important is following your own joy in enlightening your in, in igniting your purpose? 6. Did you ever quit your job to follow your purpose and do you think somebody should? Yes, and I don't know. What brings you great great joy? The dharma. If you unexpectedly amassed a good-sized fortune, what would you do differently? I would build my business more quickly. Great. Perfect. Uh So we're out of short answer now. I want to just go back and make sure that I'm clear on what your definition of the Dharma is. For me, it's the teachings of Buddhism and the vast, and when I say vast, 
I am not joking, (laughs) the vast profundity of the teachings of the Buddha Dharma. That's what I mean, but I'm not saying everybody has to study it, but I mean the vast wisdom of the great Buddhist teachers that have come before us. And so you're most joyous when you are and when you are uh, enthralled in learning something new about that or your practice with it or what are we when i'm connecting about? with the dharma when i feel i'm bringing it into my life and it makes sense and i'm dialoguing with the dharma as it were that that is a great joy and when i'm learning it and just bombs go off in my mind and i'm so grateful i'm so 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 grateful to be a student of buddhism very nice tell me what should listeners learn from your life Oh, my goodness. Um, hmm. You never know. (laughs) I guess you never know. You mean you never know what's coming? You never know what's around the corner? You never know what's coming. You never know how things are going to turn out. You just never know. And what should they do with that? Just uh, relax. Got it. Thank you. So it's been delightful to speak with you. Let's just make sure that we let everybody know how they can find more of you. Please tell us your website and remind us of the title of your book and when we can get our hands on it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my website is just my name, Susan Piver, P-I-V-E-R dot com. And all the information about the Open Heart Project is there. And I really, really hope that if anyone's interested in meditation, they feel free to join. It's free. And uh, my book is called Start Here Now, an, an open-hearted guide to the path and practice of meditation. And it will be out September 1st. I'm very excited for that. And those are the best ways to stay in touch. Uh, great. Great. Re- related to your books coming out soon are you going to be doing anything fun that we should make sure to participate in with your books like you're going to be speaking about it or doing interviews will we see you in the media yeah well i i will be doing interviews more like podcast interviews and i have some speaking engagements on the east coast and then i'll be creating some online offerings for people that want to interact with the material in the book too terrific so we can find that all on your website absolutely Great. So we'll look for your book. And um, my, I, if for any of you listening, I'm going to do this myself. I did this last week. Um, sign up for Susan's free weekly video. And even if you're feeling a little bit intimidated, you can watch her videos, listen to her advice. It doesn't mean that you have to start your practice, I'm assuming. Is that okay with you, Susan? Oh. Anyone can sign up and observe? Absolutely. And start to stick your toe in the water of a very, very wonderful, rich, rewarding practice. Those are my words. I know they're not yours. Um, And is there anything that we missed speaking about today that you'd like to offer before we end? Uh, No, I don't think so. I I just want to uh, uh, offer you my appreciation for such good questions, rich questions, deep questions. And um, I just, it was lovely to talk with you. Great. My my pleasure. Very lovely to talk to you. Where, where are you talking to us from today? I'm in my office in Somerville, Massachusetts, and it's the most beautiful day imaginable. It's And the birds are chirping, and I'm looking at a garden, and I'm very happy right now. <laughs> I've, I have very much been enjoying the birds in the background. We'll make sure to leave those in our recording today because oh they're a wonderful, beautiful song. Good. Um, so... Well, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, too. You're welcome. You've been listening to the Life Purpose Advisor podcast with Angie Swartz and my guest today, Susan Piver. I hope you've enjoyed what you've listened to and hopefully what you've learned today. If you'd like more information about Susan Piver, please visit her website at susanpiver.com and check out her new book that's coming in September 1st. If you'd also like more information about finding your life purpose, you can connect with me at lifepurposeadvisor.com or at, on Facebook. We will look forward to seeing you next time.